Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Ferlaino, for this very, very interesting talk. Gracias por esta charla tan interesante y, bueno, esto de las tecnologías cuánticas está... Quantum technologies are, in fact, a hot uh, topic. And uh, recently, it has been said in Europe that this is one of the uh, technologies that we don't want China to know about. So there's a, a world-level uh, competition regarding uh, who will uh, know more about this. Let's go on to the next uh, speaker, Professor Jean-Marie Lenn. He was born in France. Uh, he shared the Nobel Prize for uh, Chemistry uh, together with Charles J. Spiderson and John Donald J. Cram for his studies on the chemical ba basis of molecular recognition. That is the way in which molecules recognize and selectively bind to each other, which also plays a fundamental role in biological processes. Over the years, his work led him to the definition of a new field of chemistry for which he has proposed the term supramolecular chemistry as it deals with the complex entities formed by the association of two or more chemical species held together by non-covalent intermolecular forces. Subsequently, the area developed into the chemistry of self-organization processes and more recently towards adaptative chemistry, dynamic networks, and complex systems. Lenz studied chemistry at the University of Strasbourg, earning his PhD in 1963. He then spent a year in the Robert Burns Woodward's laboratory at Harvard University, where he was part of the team working on the total synthesis of vitamin B12. He also uh, took a course in quantum mechanics and began carrying out his first calculations with Roald Hoffman. And in 1964, he witnessed the first steps in what would later be known as the Woodward Hoffman rules. In 1966, he became a lecturer at the University of Strasbourg and set up his own laboratory, where he focused his work on the physical chemistry of organic compounds, putting the experience gained in organic chemistry, quantum theory, and physical uh, methods into practice. In 1970, he was appointed professor of Organic Chemistry of the Louis Pasteur University at Strasbourg. He is presently professor at the University of Strasbourg University for Advanced Study, and he's author of over 1,000 scientific publications. He's a member of many academies and scientific institutions and has won many international awards and prizes, including the Humboldt Prize, the Royal Society's Davy Medal, and the ISA Medal for Science. He received the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany Germany and named Grand Officer of the French Legion of Honor. So uh, his uh, talk will leave uh, no one indifferent, and it's about the steps towards a, a complex uh, matter, chemistry. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Len not only for being here with us today, but also his involvement with uh, science and scientific institutions in the Basque Country, uh, specifically with the Donosti International Physics Center, as he's participated in four of the five editions of Passion for Knowledge, and he's been meeting different uh, uh, secondary school students, and he's also part of the International uh, Committee uh, for Nano Sciences in the Basque Country. So thank you, Professor Land, for your support and your commitment. Now, yes, Professor Land, the floor is yours. So it's very nice to be back in Bilbao. I've been here before the Guggenheim existed. The city was very different, very different. The Guggenheim, which is architecture, which is an imagination of an, an artist, uh, the architect who did that, Frank Gehry, changed the city. That is a very important effect also, huh? the, which is in the brain of people and so on. But we heard a fantastic talk, and now I want to tell you where this comes from. So, steps towards complex matter. We are all complex matter. And chemistry is uh, maybe a solution, or maybe the solution. We have to start very early, very, very early. What is going on? 
Oh, oh yeah, what's going on? No, no, I want to go back because, <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> we have to start very early. And it's now well established, thanks to measurements of the background radiation in the universe, that our universe is about 13.7 billion years old, but it started in a big explosion. Very, very quickly, it expanded, and that is the beginning of the universe. At that time, it was very hot, and there was no chemistry. There was, no, there was physics, and that's the age of physics. Then the universe cooled down very quickly, particles formed, they got together and made a more complex state. And chemistry started around there when atoms existed, were formed, and could interact with one another to form molecules. That's the start of chemistry. But then it did stop. Molecules became more and more complex. They interacted with one another. They made membranes, they made particles, they made sort of also shells with something inside, like compartments. And a new property appeared, a very important one, which is life on our planet. There's very probably life in many places in the universe. We are not alone. But what counts for us is what we're doing here. That's the age of biology. Luckily, it didn't stop there, because with biology, you don't think yet. So another property appeared, thought. And that is steps towards more and more complex forms of matter. Thought is represented by the thinker of Auguste Rodin, the sculpture, which is a very well-known one, the person sitting there and thinking very hard. And that is also science. And there is a person who illustrates that. He's the one who started <laughs> this whole story of passion for knowledge. Now, this is not a wrong slide. That's not a bad slide. That is our knowledge. Right now, cosmologists tell us there's 68% of dark energy, 27% of dark matter, 95% of darkness. Not very clear. But there's 5% of visible matter. And I like to say that that's the matter that matters. <laughs> because we are part of it. This is our matter. We are only part of the 5% of what is in the universe. And this 5% was able to understand the rest, or at least much of it. So how can this happen? As a function of time, there were objects built up in our universe which were more and more complex and had more and more information. So from divided to condensed, to organized, to living, to thinking matter, and maybe do something even beyond our own thinking, which is hard to imagine because how can you think about your own thinking? But you cannot exclude it. Science cannot exclude things like that. So that's the way towards complex matter. So, there's a very big question we have to ask. That's probably the biggest. Sorry for quantum mechanics. It was a fantastic talk, but, but there's a brain in that lady, and it's the brain which makes it possible. Huh? That's science. How does matter become complex? Mankind invented something which can maybe explain how from an elementary particle you go to a thinking organism in the evolution of the universe. And if you look at just three areas of science, physics deals with the general laws of the universe. These are the basic laws, everything depends on them. Biology deals with the rules of life. These are not laws, these are rules because they're deduced from the laws. And what is chemistry doing? Chemistry is trying to build the bridge. How can you go from very general laws to the expression of these laws in, for instance, a human being? What is the pathway? How can you reach that? Now, an answer to this big question is a word, which is just a word which gives you an impression, but it doesn't mean that you know by self-organization. In other words, my belief is, no, I shouldn't believe, scientists never believe, no, there's no belief in science. Huh? My thought is that it's by self-organization. Our universe is built in such a way that it will generate organization and one even say that it's a cosmic imperative. This can be discussed, that is philosophical, that's metaphysical, not just physical, but metaphysical. <laughs> 
And this is something which um, I think is built in in our, the structure of our universe. Now, these are the bricks of this famous visible matter of which we are made of. And this is another thing which is very simple. Everybody here has heard of the periodic table, I suppose. This is this, the, a table which contains the elements making up visible matter. And even that, which was, this, which was discovered along the years, and the table was initially proposed by uh, Mendeleev in 1864, uh, 1869, pardon. And um, that table is complete. If you look at that table, you know what visible matter is made of. I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very embarrassed by that because it looks like dogmatic. It's not dogmatic, it's like mathematics. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here you have one electron, one proton, two electrons, two protons, and so on. So the table is full. In other words, beyond visible matter, we know there's no other brick of our universe. It's disturbing, it's very disturbing. It would be nice to be able to have invent many, many other elements. There are none. So we know what our universe is made of, the visible matter in our universe. And uh, so this is the playground of chemistry. Chemists are like children. They take these bricks and they put them together. Like Lego, when you play Lego, you put them together, but you have an infinity of possibilities because there's no, there's no limit in the number. And of course, then you can combine these 92 natural elements. Of course, there are some which are artificially created, but I don't talk about those ones. They're still part of it. They obey the same laws. So, uh, chemists started by taking atoms and making molecules, like to take bricks and make houses. And this is molecular chemistry, which is uh, based on the fact that atoms can be put together by strong links, which chemists call covalent bonds. And this is uh, then this, this, the way of building up houses from the bricks of matter. Now, milestones, let's have a quick look, just a very quick look at how this is built. In 1828, Friedrich Wöhler in Germany succeeded in making a compound called urea, which is in urine, from another chemical compound, which is uh, ammonium cyanate. Now, the big thing there was that he was able to transform, and that is one, this is the power of chemistry, the fact that you can transform matter, us, by changing the molecules and the position of the atoms. So he was able to make urea from ammonium cyanate. Big problem at that time, people were thinking you could never produce something contained in a living organism without the use of a magic force called the vital force. Now, Wöhler was very conscious of the fact that by making urea from ammonium cyanate, which was not contained in an organism, he had broken that law and said this, this magic laws more doesn't exist. It's just the same thing. What is not living, what is living, is made of the same atoms, the same molecules, and so on. Now, just to show, 150 or so years later, this big molecule, vitamin B12, which we have in our blood, uh, was made in the laboratory, but what chemists call total synthesis, that means taking each of these atoms, putting them together in the right position, in a very long, series of experiments, a very long way to build them up. It took, in fact, um, 120 men and women years to do that, if you add everything together. I worked on that with Woodward. There were two groups collaborating, Robert Woodward at Harvard and Albert Eschenmoser at the ETH in Zurich. And uh, that, oh, you don't see that. Down left is my part of it. <laughs> I wanted just to show that, that, you know, if you participate in a thing like that, it's not important what you have done. But all of us scientists, they bring a stone. It can be a small stone, it can be a big stone. But it's our stone, and nobody will take it away. So, since then, of course, many other reactions have been discovered, and uh, the molecular chemistry has, is still very, very strong science, developing very much, and nowadays one would not build up the molecule of vitamin B12 the same way as it was done in the 1970s. 
So that is continuing until new materials are made, new products, new compounds, new reactions, new, new drugs, and so on. And then the question is, what else should we look at? Here is a cancer cell, the blue ball, and two killer cells. The killer cells have to find out what is a cancer cell and destroy it. How do they know? No, just uh, sort of in quotation marks. How do the killer cells know that the other one is a cancer cell? If they make a mistake, you have a problem. Either they kill a healthy cell or they do not kill a transformed cell, a cancer cell. What's the reason? How does it work? Here is uh, the HIV virus, the blue dots, and uh, a red blood cell, no, sorry, a white blood cell colored in red artificially. And uh, when the virus hits the white blood cell, it can infect. That's the same, COVID-19, same stuff. Huh? When it finds its uh, target, then it can in invade the cells. What is happening? How is this possible? Now, these bodies, these cells are made of molecules that are defined by a membrane, like a soap bubble, uh, if you want, like a soap bubble, but there are specific molecules sitting into this, in this soap bubble, and so that the surface contains information about what the cell is. So the contact between the two tells the killer cell that the other one is or is not a cancer cell. So this leads to a chemistry which doesn't deal with the molecules themselves, but the population of molecules where they assemble together. And this is what we called supramolecular chemistry because it deals with collections, assemblies of molecules, which then are able to interact and to fit together. And so there are interactions, of course, for a physicist, all this is the same type of interaction, but you have to categorize them to understand what is going on. And three main properties were studied over the years. How do molecules recognize one another? How does a cancer cell, a killer cell recognize a cancer cell? and also other properties like how do they react, how do molecules react with one another, and how can they carry through membranes a given uh, cargo, a, a given other molecule. So, molecular recognition is the basis. Without molecular recognition, we would not exist, because our molecules in our body, all the time, they do that. We, they have to do the right recognition at the right time, in the right place, in the cell, at the right speed, and so on. And the molecular recognition can be expressed, of course it's an information type of, of uh, feature, but it can be de defined in very simple ways. First of all, it has to interact. There has to be some glue between the two, in term molecular interactions. And then the second very important property is that there must be information. If you have no information, of course, you cannot have recognition. Very simply, in the very simplest way, it's to fit together the geometries and interactions. Plus attracts minus, plus repels plus, and so on. And already at the end of the 19th century, it was proposed that it is like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. This was Emil Fischer, who in 1894 published a very famous paper, which is the, in fact defines how biological molecules in an organism operate. The fact that they uh, fit together like a lock and a key. Of course, now we know the lock is, uh, is adaptive and so on. It's much more complicated, but basically the image of a lock and a key is a correct one. And the best known, of uh, the most illustrative of this uh, type of uh, information storage is in our genome. Our genome is trivially simple. Our genome is written with four letters, not more, which can, uh, which can get together in two pairs. So the genome, and you have heard about DNA, messenger RNA and all that, now thanks to COVID, <laughs> People know a lot about RNA and DNA now. Huh? They have been much more interested <laughs> because people were very concerned about. So our genome is a long string of... Uh, of, of uh, it's a bit difficult to see because this thing is not very easy. But there's a long string which has letters picked onto the string 
that just four chemists have given them names, uh, sort of uh, bar barbarian names, if you may say, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, but just four. And the difference between a tomato and an elephant is just a sequence of letters, nothing else. Of course, there's a lot of, uh, of work going on after you have this information in the genome, but the basis is the genome. So now this is a storage. How can you process this information? You can process by simple a binary system. We heard about 0, 1, 0, 1 before. Here it's 2, 3, 2, 3. Either the interacts, two of these um, letters interact by two points of attachment or, and two others by three points. So it's just a question of reading two contacts or three contacts. And this is this case, uh, adenine interacts with thymine or uracil in, by two points of interaction represented by the little dots or by three points of interactions between guanine and cytosine, which are, is also represented by the little dots. So there's a molecular recognition, a complementary pattern, and that is the pattern in, by which the information in our organism is uh, read out from the basic genome, which is the information storage. So uh, the important thing here is, and this was probably the most important, uh, I would say the, the most important feature which supramolecular chemistry brought out, which it already existed, of course, but it brought out and made conscious that there is a very important factor that in addition, as chemistry was defined, to be the structure, the science of the structure and transformation of matter, it is also an information science. It's a science of informed matter. In fact, I may say that all matter is informed. The shape of a molecule, the way they attach to each other, is uh, the way in which um, information is contained. So the storage is at the molecular level, and the processing of this information is at the supramolecular level. So uh, with then, chemists became more and more interested in making, in Emil Fischer's terms, locks for keys or keys for locks. And here, for instance, there are key, three keys. There is one lock, and of course, quite clear that the red key fits into the lock. And so many laboratories around the world worked on uh, making locks for keys or keys for locks, uh, making molecules which can fit together and understanding what one has to do in order to fit together. When I say fit together, of course, nothing is 100%. In fact, in science, zero does not exist and 100 does not exist. There is no zero percent, there is no hundred percent. There are always sort of gray zones. And uh, so this is, means that when you, uh, all these interactions in our body also, there are mistakes being made and then there's a whole system which is much more complex for correcting for this uh, type of errors. Let me just show you some applications in life science. I take them from what we have done, but there are many, many, many others. As you know, first of all, I should state, but most of you, I guess, I have, are convinced of that, that basic research tries to acquire knowledge, and when we apply it, then we have applications, which can be, first of all, the most fundamental one is the uh, information which is residing in molecular recognition, and for instance, making drugs. A drug is the key for, the for a biological lock. You have to make something, which is an, uh, a molecule, which is designed so as to find the lock and to either block it or amplify its action, or correct for it. And this is a, a drug. When you buy a drug in, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a shop, or when uh, companies make drugs, they make molecules which are designed for interacting with a given target, and as selectively as possible. Otherwise, you get side effects, which is, of course, always the case. I mean, always some side effects. It's never 100% safe. Nothing is 100%. Think about that. This, is, this was also the question with the RNA viruses, uh, RNA vaccines. It cannot be 100%. So there are always cases where there's something going a little bit wrong. But that's, that's the way life is. Huh? 100% does not exist. Uh, we also then designed objects like this one, which is this, uh, this type of, it's a molecule which is looking like a sort of a, a sphere, 
the hair, yeah, it's difficult to see. And there's a, it's a cavity, you put a European ion in, one, one of these objects in the te periodic table, uh, and then uh, this emits red light. You can attach it to a search, a search engine, which is an anti antibody or an immunoprotein, and this then can be used for medical diagnostics because the red bulb will sort of indicate where, uh, where the other one is going and what type of disease you may have. A very important property is I talked about a membranes and things going through the membrane is gene transfer. Gene transfer is a way in introducing new genes or new letters into the genome. This makes genetically modified organisms. Now, I usually make a very strong point in my lectures like this one. We need genetically modified organisms. Don't forget, and those people who will not want them, the countries who will not take them, they have a big problem. We need them. We need to make plants which resist heat. We need to make plants which use less water. We need to, also animals are already made, which then build up um, uh, drugs, huh? to make the drugs, proteinic drugs. So genetically modified organisms are necessary and we will use them despite the fact that some people oppose them. Uh, let me just give you an example on supramolecular materials, materials which are built on molecules uh, and uh, by attachment, by where they interact. Uh, we had introduced in 1990 uh, a, a given type of plastic, if you may say, I mean a, a polymer molecule, which is based on interactions between the molecules and not on linkages, covalent linkages. And then, this happens often, not often, happens in science, that people have seen that there's a property of interest there, and maybe one can exploit it. So, in 1990, we introduced this concept of supramolecular polymers, and then there were people who were trying to make them biocompatible. And in 2013, 23 years later, these materials were used for making cardiovascular implants for children. This was a small company in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, which I never had heard of before. They wrote me an email and said, we have used supramolecular polymers to make these materials for cardiac implants for children. And here is the first child which was treated in 2013. And you see 23rd of October 2013 was the implantation, Dominica. She, this was done in the, at the Bakulev Center for Cardiac Pediatric Surgery in Moscow by Leo Bukheria. And both of them look very fine, huh? they're very happy, and he's happy too, of course, because it worked. <laughs> and so this is something which, of course, for when you have done basic research, uh, you never know where something new can come up, but there are many intelligent people around the world who see what to do, and then they develop it, and suddenly something appears somewhere you haven't predicted. This has now been done for, this is just Celtium, this was a long, this long time ago. They also made now heart valves, which have been implanted in different places, and this is now uh, considered as a, as a breakthrough in surgical practice to use this, this as very simple, rather simple um, materials for, uh, um, as biomaterials. Another property, since the interactions between molecules are weaker than the interaction between atoms which make the molecules, that means the non-covalent and the covalent interactions, materials have also interesting new properties. That is a plastic, it's a film, you, see, you will barely see it because it's a sort of a perfect film. You can cut it with scissors, then you superimpose the two ends, and if you, if you are not looking for the best performance, but just to demonstrate, you press with your finger and then you can stretch and it sticks. So this is very simple. This material, you just cleave it, you superimpose, you press and it sticks. And this is only one example of what are now called self-healing materials. So let's go back to this fundamental basic property of uh, matter in our universe, which is the fact that it will self-organize. And a good example, everybody now knows about viruses. Huh? 
And the virus is a self-organized entity which builds itself up from the building blocks. I showed here the initially the most simple one, in fact. It was the first virus which was understood. It is made of 2,130 bricks, mole molecules, protein molecules, which get together. And because there's recognition between the surfaces, they get together in a given way. And this way, in this case, allows the formation of a sort of a helical uh, architecture with a hole in the middle, the DNA, the RNA, the, 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 nuclear, the nuclear, info, nuclear information is in the middle, and this spontaneously builds up. It looks like magic again. It's not magic. We understand all the details. It's just the right structure, the right interactions, and the right shape. Huh? Because if they look like this, of course, you can assemble, when they assemble them, they have to go around. If you were like that, you wouldn't. Then you would do it this way and not this way. Huh? So, this is a programmed chemical system, and just on Monday, which was just yesterday, there was the COVID-19 virus brought the Nobel Prize, if I may say, <laughs> to two persons, Katalin Carico and Drew Weissman, uh, because these were the first ones who, uh, of course, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of work done by people uh, around the world on messenger RNA. In fact, you know, um, I can go a little bit on. The French government was rather unhappy that no French company did find a, a messenger RNA vaccine. Sanofi, for instance, was working on more classical vaccines. But don't forget, the people who got the Nobel Prize for messenger RNA were too French. Huh? Because they did it, this was François Jacob and Jacques Monod, they could in 1965. So that is why science, how science works. Huh? It was discovered that it, right, they were not alone because there were many other people had worked on it, but they were the ones who had made the most important steps. And so it just, this is how science works. It was done in the Institut Pasteur in Paris, but then many people worked on it. It went all over the place. And then Carrie Carico and Drew Weissman, after a lot of problems, they finally found a solution, and that is why we are here. Without that vaccine, we would not talk today. Huh? When it happened, when it started in 2020, beginning of 2020, I was convinced that it would take 10 years or eight years to get a vaccine. They found the vaccine in less than a year. That is why we are here. You wouldn't sit here otherwise. You would, or maybe you would have big masks, you know, and a big helmet to, to, to protect yourself. So that is, again, science has solved the problem. That's why we are here. So uh, let's just show, uh, so in the laboratory then, many people were interested in trying to, to design objects which would spontaneously assemble in a given way. And I just show you a few cases. What we did is say in this case is to use organic molecules which are able to link to a metal ion, like iron or cobalt or uh, nickel, or manganese and so on, in a given way. All this is controlled by the way they interact, so it, uh, the architecture is determined by the molecule you make, uh, by the metal ion you use. The metal ion is like a cement, but in sort of a, let's say, an informed cement, because when uh, an iron uh, uh, and, and interacts with a molecule, it does it in a given way and you have then to design your object in such a way that you can get a final architecture. For instance, one can make artificial double helices and triple helices, which has nothing to do with DNA. It's just, for us it was a, nice, it was a game to say, look, the double helix exists, let's make a double helix which does not exist in nature. You can make it, that's it. Of course, this one does not, it doesn't contain all the same kind of information as the natural one, but just to show. You can make also grids where you have metal ions nicely positioned at the intersection between molecules. And in fact, I was discussing, you, you know, with uh, uh, Rainer Plast uh, about the possibility to use these kind of things also for storing information. And uh, we will have a discussion with him. He should be coming to Strasbourg pretty soon. Uh, you can make circular architectures like this one. We have five molecules, a blue one, a white one, a red one, a green one, and a yellow one, which are held together by iron 
which just glues them together, and when you mix those, they automatically form this structure. Or you can make a sort of a nano cylinder where you have linear molecules, flat ones, and if you use, again, the right way of, of designing them, you automatically generate this uh, nano cylinder. Uh, it is of interest also for nanoscience and nanotechnology because the ultimate would be that rather to have to make your transistors, your chips, that you make them make themselves. Huh? In principle, it's possible. And the easiest way to convince you is that the best and the most powerful object we still have in our universe is our brain. All the physics, all the chemistry, all the biology comes from the brain. Huh? So, we have it. This is self-organized. You don't make the brain. It makes itself on the basis of the way in which the development of a complex organ, the brain, is built up. Now, let me just show you uh, on one slide what we are doing now. So this, of course, this thing field has developed enormously. But the thing is, after this, when you design, you have to make the right components and you have to design them in such a way that they get together to generate a final architecture. So you need information, you program your system, you let it run, and you generate given entities like the ones I just showed. The next step is to let the system do all that. In other words, beyond designing it exactly, let's try to make systems where you can mix many things together and they would nevertheless find out what they need to build themselves up. That means selection is then built into the system. For that, you need diversity, many different types of bricks, and dynamics, because the first collision, which leads to, a, to a, an interaction between the components, should not be too stable. It has to search. It has to be able to dissociate and to reform itself or change in the process. And this then leads to the possibility of having adaptive systems. If you change the conditions, the object you start with will adapt to the change in question, for instance, when you change uh, the temperature or you go from uh, water to another solvent and so on. And this will then lead to what we now mostly do, which is adaptive chemistry, which can be used for uh, developing new ways of finding biologically active substances and also dynamic materials of this type where the material can fall apart and then reassemble with properties which depend on which can be depending on the medium, and therefore they respond to that. So, the evolution of chemistry comes molecular first, supramolecular, assemblies, populations, organized, this is built into the system, then dynamic because you, have, you want the system to be able to evolve, adaptive, and towards life and thought, which are the highest and the most complex features on our planet. Now, I would like to, I hope by what I have told you, you see that chemistry deals with generating, of course, first of all, to understand what already exists, the molecules which are in nature. But these are not all of them. Nature didn't explore everything. Nature just explored if there were questions raised in, the, in evolution, to answer that, those questions, then uh, all the organisms which could not answer, they disappeared. And it's not just today that we have a, a problem with biodiversity. There were many cases in the, in the past where diversity was reduced, simply because there was a change uh, in, uh, in temperature, in pressure, or a meteorite was falling down to the earth. Uh, and uh, so there, there's a wide, uh, a wide variety of objects which can be, uh, exist uh, already in nature, but there are many, 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 many more than what already exists which have to be made, which can be made. And so chemistry can create new expressions of matter. Like I like to say, the book of chemistry, you have to write it, not only to read it. Of course, you have to read it. You have to try to understand what already exists, but you can write it. The same way also, in terms of music, the score of chemistry, you have to compose it, not just to play it. And so chemistry has the creative power. We can consider that it is sort of the art of matter. Now, this was already said many years ago by somebody you certainly know, Leonardo da Vinci. 
He was a scientist, an engineer, and of course an artist. But he wrote a sentence which was very deep, very profound. He said, where nature finishes to produce its own species, we are part of that. We are part of evolution. We are the result of evolution of natural uh, objects, natural chemistry, so to say. Man begins, man and woman, of course, <laughs> begins using natural things. What is it? This is the periodic table of elements, the bricks available. Huh? What is available? In harmony with his very nature, that means the laws of physics. You cannot do things against that. Right? That's given way you put things together. In fact, it's very interesting here. We have to think about the fact that what is possible is limited because you have to follow the basic laws and you cannot do things which don't follow these laws. So any law limits your freedom. That can be, for sociology, quite interesting statement also. And then the end of this sentence is fantastic, especially for an artist like Leonardo. To create an infinity of species. All those which don't exist yet, you can make them. Oh, fine, sorry, you can make them if you follow the laws. But there's an infinity of possibilities. We are only one expression of that. So there are certainly organisms, living organisms on, our plan uh, on other planets. They will be made with the same building blocks. But they may be totally different. They may have 200 feet, or, or maybe they will, will, they will. No, I don't think they will live at minus uh, liquid helium. That is a bit would be too slow. No evolution. So it's not just natural, but man-made, which is possible when you know the way in which you do it. Now, in the ancient Greek mythology. There was the Prometheus who stole the fire of knowledge from the gods. And here he's running away with the fire of knowledge in his hand, looking over his shoulder to see if the other guys don't run after him to catch him. They were not able to catch him, and he gave it to mankind. And here he shows the fire of knowledge and science. The interesting and the very important thing is that we cannot give it back. What you know, you know for the time to come. So, you have to live with it. And our path leads us from looking for knowledge, for the quest of knowledge, to the control of our destiny. I am convinced that natural evolution has brought us where we are, but we will modify ourselves. That is not a question of just transhumanism and so on. It is normal. And in fact, we are already modified. Some of you have new, um, have new lenses in your eyes. This is not natural. Huh? It's a plastic. You may have a hip of titanium. That's not natural. And if you, for instance, get a heart transplant, you cannot say to your wife or to your spouse, I give you my heart. It's not your heart anymore. So this is just pumps and circuits and so on. And uh, I'm pretty sure, and this is, has started already, thanks to the people who have, may have uh, used stem cells, that it is possible to develop organs by manipulating the stem cells. So at some stage, it's quite probable that we, not have to need, we do not need a donor of a heart, for instance, but you make it. You put it in your fridge, and when you need it, you build it in. <laughs> now, it looks like a joke, but I think we, we are a piece of um, we are a mechanism, we are a machinery, and uh, the fantastic thing is, of course, the brain. I must say that the universe evolved an organ which can sink back on the origin of the universe where it, for which it comes. That's something quite... Unbelievable. But science has not to do with belief. So, I have not said much about mathematicians, so I have one here, David Hilbert. He wanted on his tombstone to be written two sentences. First, we müssen wissen, we must know. That is what drives scientists, huh? we must know. And then a vote of confidence 
Wir werden wissen. We will know. Here you have to have a lot of confidence, but I think science, scientists would be desperate if you were not convinced that you will more, know more and more. So, here again is dear old Prometheus showing science, showing, saying that we will know, and science shapes the future of humanity, participate, and this is passion for knowledge, which allows you to make progress and which will lead us further into the future and for the young people participate. I don't say that life, that our earth should only have scientists because we need artists, we need musicians, we need bakers, we need to have bread and so on. But I think everybody should have some scientific knowledge. Everybody. People are ready to play tennis three hours or maybe an afternoon a week. Why not spend an hour every week on science? Because science really makes, that's so determinant in what we are and what we will be in the future. So this is also why this series of uh, meetings where knowledge is on the forefront are so important but not only in a few cities, there should be all over the world. And I think we should all really get a basic training in science, just to know, because it's so fundamental. It's like breathing oxygen. Huh? You breathe oxygen, and if I, and I breathe, there's a lot of things happening in my body. And all this is based on science. So I hope that I have convinced those of you who are not yet scientists. Thank you. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have another slide which I almost forgot. <laughs> but it shows another feature of science. Science is the only human activity which is universal, not just on the Earth, universal, because it's valid here to the end of the universe. And this is what I show here. This tiny planet, this piece of dust, has generated an organism which can do that, and science has no borders. I think that is also something I want to very strongly to emphasize. Scientists are friends all over the world because it's valid for everybody. And I think that's a very important also a message for young people, that if you are a scientist, you're, sorry, you don't need to be a scientist, but science is what you can use to know everybody, to be friends with everybody around the earth, because you all depend on it. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> I didn't keep that slide, so to, to upload twice. <laughs> Maybe that's a way to do it. Huh? <laughs> Let me give you, maybe there can be a question. Two questions. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, let me just tell you the difference between molecular chemistry and supramolecular chemistry. It's very simple. A single molecule of water which is three atoms, H, O, H, sort of a triangle, huh? cannot boil, cannot freeze, a single molecule is isolated. A glass of water is still water, but it can boil, it can freeze, it has an index of refraction, it has a viscosity. What's the difference? Just the molecules of water interact. So that's a sort of a very simple, very, very, the simplest way to show what is molecular, isolated molecules, and from the moment they get together, they do something with one another, then you have properties which don't exist before. And that's a way for me to sort of say, okay, the complexity of a brain is stepwise, 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 an evolution towards more and more complex states with many, many more molecules, and finally you end up with this fantastic organ, which is the brain. 
Voilà. <laughs> There's a question there. <laughs> There's a courageous person there. <laughs> mm, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, do you think it will be possible in the future to create fully artificial life as a maybe next step of this increase of complexity? Uh, we exist, therefore it's possible. That's the simplest answer. It doesn't give you an answer exactly. But right now, in, Bilbao, in um, San Sebastian, there is also a meeting in parallel which deals with origin of life. And many people now work more and more on the origin of life, how our life has evolved. Of course, you cannot go back and prove that what you say, what you find out is correct. But you, the people are working on trying to find explanations or, let's say, ways by which life, our life could have occurred. This is done trying to understand the origin of our life. But, as you point out, there can be other lives. And uh, very probably uh, on other planets there will be other types of life, maybe based on something else, but it's sort of limited. This is also something, you know, uh, the interactions between molecules, the, what they do is determined by the atoms, by the way, by quantum mechanics and that kind of stuff, you yeah? <laughs> know. And uh, so uh, you cannot escape that. So, and the periodic table will be the same. And the bond between a hydrogen and an oxygen will be the same. So, you have a toolbox. The toolbox will reassemble itself in very, very, very many ways, but it is the same toolbox. And in our universe, there is no other toolbox for visible matter. <laughs> Maybe in a, in a black hole, there may be something else. <laughs> Other particles, huh? and uh, maybe, maybe, but at least we know what we are, we know what we are made of, and this is the same everywhere. That is why you can say there is water on a planet, because you know the properties of water. So you know there is water there or no water there. Iron. Iron has certain spectroscopic properties, and you find out that this planet has iron. That is why they know that methane, there is methane on Jupiter or on some of its satellites. So this is methane is the same. CH4 is CH4. It's a bit uh, disappointing, huh? Because <laughs> we cannot make another methane. <laughs> So I should also add that we should, uh, I think, what happens, this passion for knowledge, which is something which doesn't exist in another country, sorry, yeah, in another region of the world, let's say, <laughs> because this is really having a whole population together. Okay, there are other initiatives, but not, uh, not to that extent. So. Thanks to the Basque country. <laughs>
And I believe the best way of finishing is uh, with a big round of applause for uh, Francesca and Jean-Marie Lem. And I would like to thank you all for uh, coming here today. And we will uh, continue uh, seeing each other in other uh, activities organized both in San Sebastian and in Bilbao by in the uh, Donosti International Physics Center. Thank you. <laughs>